Good day, dear friends. This is History Lessons with Tamara Edelman. Today we will talk about Walt Disney. Thanks to everyone who made this lecture possible, our sponsors on YouTube, our patrons on Patreon, and those who support us on the Boosty platform. I hope you won't forget to like and share. When Walt Disney or Disney, you can speak in Russian in this way, as I found out after some research. So when our hero was studying at school, he lived in the city of Kansas City. He really liked to portray someone. He generally liked to attract attention in every possible way. For example, when they had craft lessons, well, something like our craft lessons, he signed up for cooking classes. Where, of course, in those times, at the beginning of the 20th century, and he only was the only went. boy. Everyone seemed to laugh, but he didn't care. And he portrayed all sorts of characters and did it very well. Once he came to school dressed as President Lincoln, and even somehow did some kind of makeup. And to make sure everyone knew that he was no longer Walt Disney, but President Lincoln, he memorized the entire Gettysburg Address and recited it. The teachers, of course, were delighted. They took him to all the classes, everywhere he performed as the president. But that was not his only role. He had another friend, Walt Pfeiffer, with whom they became very close in school. And Disney loved spending time with him at his house, where the rules were very strict. His father was tough, strict allowed very little. We'll talk more about this later. He ordered to go to bed early because they had to get up very early in the morning and go to work. And Disney went to bed, then sneaked out of the window and went to visit Pfeiffer and there had fun with him for several hours. So they and Pfeiffer did something like, well, I don't know, artistic reading, let's say. They acted out some scenes, did something else, even went to some performances and received prizes. In general, he liked all this theatrical activity, but most of all, he liked to portray his favorite movie character. And this character was Charlie Chaplin, whose films were just starting to be shown in cinemas at that time. Walt went to see Chaplin a lot. He was thrilled. And then with another Walt, with his friend, they acted out some scenes from these early short films of Chaplin. Walt was always like Chaplin. He was very good at it. When his career started in Hollywood, Chaplin helped him several times. Chaplin really liked Disney cartoons, and he helped a lot of people in general. Chaplin was one of the creators of United Artists, a company that helped independent producers, directors, actors. And for a while, Disney had a contract with United Artists which was signed when he was in a difficult situation, when other producers treated him very harshly. In general, they helped again. Chaplin spoke at various banquets and celebrations of Disney, spoke good words about him, and Disney adored him. There is a version that Mickey Mouse was supposed to imitate many of Chaplin's movements. It's probably difficult to prove. And there are many different stories about Mickey Mouse, so there's more to come on this topic. But in any case, it is known that, for example, in the early 1930s, Disney constantly demanded from his employees to watch Chaplin's films continuously. He believed that their characters, not only Mickey, should move like Chaplin. They watched them at normal speed or in slow motion, to understand these movements. In the cartoon, The Three Little Pigs, which marked an incredible turning point in Disney's life and in the life of animation in general. In the cartoon, The Three Little Pigs, there is a scene where the wolf knocks on the door of the pigs. 
It is believed that when they drew this knock on the door, Disney watched the film The Kid by Chaplin many times with his employees. When representatives of the welfare office come to the house of the Chaplin character, the tramp, heartless, of course, the representatives of the welfare office to take the kid away. They watched it, analyzed it, and created something similar. In other words, Chaplin from childhood to adulthood was a person whom Disney greatly admired and was inspired by. Chaplin was a person who helped him many times, shared his work experience with studios, with banks, and helped a lot. But then comes the era after the Second World War. And Chaplin in America finds himself under incredible criticism for various reasons. He is accused of immorality because he had already moved away from this previous image of his and he made the film Monsieur Verdoux about a serial killer who marries elderly women even though he already has a wife and a family to support. He does it all for that reason. He marries elderly women and subsequently gets rid of them, takes their money, which was already a somewhat unacceptable plot for Hollywood. And at the end of the film, when Monsieur Verdoux is arrested and sentenced to death, he then utters the famous phrase, he says, killing. A few people makes you a criminal, killing millions makes you a hero. After that, Chaplin began to be accused of anti-American activities and was almost labeled as a communist. A very unpleasant attack on him began. And eventually in 1952, he went to Great Britain for a short time. He was actually a British citizen, but of course he had an American visa and he went on this short trip, but his visa was not renewed and he could not simply return to America. After that, he vowed that he would never show his films in America again and move to Switzerland. Indeed, he will return to America only after a fairly long period of time. But what does Disney have to do with it? When he heard about what had happened, he did not react publicly at all. But there is a story that he said to one of his associates, America will be better off without this communist. Here, many of the contradictions that were in Disney are visible. Open, charming, incredibly, attracting attention, artistic, beautiful, and at the same time. If he really said this phrase, how ungrateful he is. In other words, Chaplin's left-wing views, who was not a communist at all, are already enough to consider that it was right not to let him back into America. There are an incredible number of books written about Disney. Sometimes you read and you get the feeling that you are reading about different people. The name is the same, but they write completely different things. In other words, one can tell about the path of a great animator, an amazing organizer, a brilliant producer who created the greatest films in the history of animation. You can tell about a man who was not very good at drawing, who appropriated other people's achievements. Actually, his studio worked at a loss most of the time and he couldn't really organize anything and certainly couldn't direct anything himself. You can tell about a man who made huge efforts to take care of his employees, created all the conditions for them, dreamed that the studio would be their common home, almost like a commune, a kind of beautiful community. Or you can tell about him as a tyrant, a despot, a man who paternally led the studio, did not tolerate any objections, expelled everyone who was against him and with his despotism brought the studio to a major crisis. You can tell about a man who helped everyone, who supported everyone, a man of such worthy traditional views. You can tell about him as some kind of insane fundamentalist who forbade his employees to drink alcohol, have romances, who was an anti-Semite, almost a fascist, about a man who collaborated with the FBI. So many different things are written about Disney that sometimes it's just 
left to just throw up your hands and say, where, where, where is the truth? Who to believe in this? This is a really difficult question for a historian, of course. What's interesting here is that all these different things, everything I just said, it's all written and said about Disney, and they rely on almost the same facts. It's clear that sometimes in one book they might omit something, pay more attention to something else, that's obvious. But very often the same thing is talked about in completely different ways. So our task is not to come to any final judgment, probably to think which of these versions convinces me more. I don't know yet which one convinces me more, but that's probably the interest of history, the interest of any outstanding person, that it's just, so to speak, very good, very bad, very rarely happens, and thank God. Well, let's see how this person was formed. There is a document. Which speaks of the birth of a boy named Walter Disney. But in 1891, 10 years earlier, I think most likely it was some kind of mistake. Well, or maybe there was a boy with the same name, but it leads to an incredible, completely crazy theory, in my opinion. But it's amazing how many people are involved in this, believe in it, because even during Disney's lifetime, there were talks about the fact that he was not born in Chicago at all, but was born in the south of Spain, in a village, was an illegitimate son of a certain beautiful laundress. The inhabitants of this village, of course, still believe in this and tell how various people came to them, investigated this. And there are journalists who spend a lot of effort and many years trying to prove that Disney is actually the son of this mysterious Spanish woman. Then naturally, the question arises, how did he end up in Chicago at all? In the Disney family, a very complex story is built about how she moved to California. And around this time, Disney's father was trying to make a living in California. They probably had a romance, but it's still not very clear how this child ended up in the family. Well, some strange rumors are swirling around, just like the cloud of rumors surrounding the birth of Disney. Just as when Disney died, rumors started that he didn't die, but that he was frozen because he wants to remain in a frozen state until doctors learn to cure his illness. That's also not true. He died, he was cremated, he was buried. But rumors persisted from birth to death. But if we return to more harsh facts, we know that Disney had a difficult childhood. He had a very religious and very strict and frugal father. And all three of these qualities strongly influenced the boy. His father tried many times to start some business, earn money. He moved from place to place. He didn't do well, and he loved to count every penny, which strongly affected the lives of his numerous children. He belonged to the Congregationalist Church, which is a fairly strict branch of Calvinists, so he was raised strictly and harshly. No special entertainment, work obey. He certainly let his hands go and beat them until at some point when the already grown up Walt simply grabbed his father's hands and didn't let him do it anymore. Such harsh treatment of children. And it really spoiled the relationship between Disney and his father, which had always been difficult. As always, many of his childhood complexes are derived from here, find reflection in these complex relationships in his films. I don't know. It often seems far-fetched. But the fact that these examples of severe behavior, he, to some extent, transferred into his adult life, not so much towards his daughters, 
whom he adored and spoiled, but towards his employees, whom he in some way considered his second family. There he really, on the one hand, took care of them continuously, on the other hand, controlled every step, formulated many prohibitions, could dismiss for absolutely no reason. Perhaps to some extent, this is what he absorbed from his father. And on the other hand, although he himself lived a completely different life, and lived a life in Hollywood, most of it. But at the same time, he vigorously advocated such strict morals. At some point, he was very close friends with the famous actor, Spencer Tracy. And when he found out that he had divorced his wife, he broke off relations with him, or so they said. He was cruel to his employees who could have some romance. And especially to alcohol in the workplace. despite the fact that he drank a lot, especially towards the end of his life, and smoked. Towards the end of his life, it was said that he had a lover. But overall, there were practically no complaints against him from this point of view. He once told a journalist, I'm not Walt Disney. I do what Walt Disney would never do. Walt Disney doesn't drink, but I do. Walt Disney doesn't smoke, but I do. So obviously there was some discrepancy between his Hollywood life, manners, social life, and what was once instilled in him by strict religious parents. In 1906, when Disney was five years old, the family moved from Chicago to a farm in Missouri. And this farm became a paradise for Disney. He would constantly remember it. There is also a lot of incomprehensible things here. It is believed that the father left because he was concerned about the crime in Chicago, hooliganism, and he decided to take the children away from this bad influence. Here too, you can't figure it out. But in any case, they moved, and Disney remembered all his life this. Wonderful, such a carefree existence in the bosom of nature. The animals that surrounded them horses, dogs, how wonderful it all was. And there is no doubt, of course, that these few years were probably not ideal, of course. But these few years that he spent on the farm, they made a huge impression on him. In the following years, of course, he deliberately built his image and what he told about himself. It was such a constructed image of the American success story a boy with a difficult childhood, with a tyrant father who broke through, who achieved his goal. It was all built for him. And in this story, there was such a beautiful bright spot those years on the farm. But no matter how he built it, here as it is difficult to suspect him of anything. Because if we remember, how many wonderful animals in his cartoons, if we remember Bambi, or squirrels, birds in Snow White, movies about animals that he made already. In the 1940s and 50s, it becomes clear that nature really meant a lot to him. There is a version that he actually influenced the development of ecological thinking. It's very possible. And this probably all goes back to his early childhood. His father once again finds himself on the brink of bankruptcy. They leave from there and move to Kansas City, where Walt's main school years will take place. And life here, of course, will be very difficult. Trying to earn money, his father bought what was called a newspaper delivery route. So he buys a route along which he walks with newspapers and sells them to people here. And in order to do more, to finish earlier, he and Walt and another son, Roy, the other children were much older. Two other sons and a little daughter. So Walt and Roy had to get up every day at half past four before school, no matter what the weather, and go with these newspapers. He also told various horror stories like lying in front of someone's house where he delivered the newspaper and falling asleep. Then he woke up, went on, and then he had to go to school. 
And there, of course, he slept in class. But at the same time, there are a lot of memories of how he was loved in school. Apparently, he really didn't shine in class. In general, he wasn't very good with his studies usually. But he was a joker, loved to imitate things. Everyone liked it. And he was always drawing. All sorts of people remember that he was constantly drawing, continuously drawing classmates. In the barber shop, he drew clients for some change. Then he displayed the portraits of the clients in the shop window. So he always wanted to draw. And in general, in his youth, he dreamed of becoming a caricaturist. There were a lot of drawings in the newspapers at that time. Photography, of course, already existed. But this kind of reportage photography didn't exist yet, simply because it was technically difficult. And he wanted his drawings to appear in the newspapers. His father, of course, looked at it as complete folly and didn't understand what the boy wanted. And he continued to draw. Several times he enrolled in different drawing courses. And here is a very interesting, of course, question such unexpected. Did Disney know how to draw? I mean, he drew endlessly in his youth. Then, when he was already running the studio, he wouldn't draw. And this is one of those sick questions. Once, when Disney was already famous, a boy approached him and said, You drew Mickey Mouse. He says, No, not me. It is generally believed that Mickey Mouse was drawn by his colleague Abai Verks, with whom relations were not easy either. And there is another story. Once at some reception, a fan, also a child, approached and said, Mr. Disney, draw me Mickey Mouse. And he handed the paper to Iwerks, who was standing next to him, and said, You draw. And he threw the paper back at him, saying, Draw it yourself, since your name is on it. And he left. There was, let's say, a company in his youth from which he was fired because he couldn't draw. Or maybe he could, but he was underestimated let's say. And then he just got busy with other things. Also, opinions differ. Another thing that many of his classmates, schoolmates, teachers still remember, his classmates, schoolmates, teachers still remember. And then this thing, of course, will manifest throughout his life. This is his absolute self-confidence. Here, it seems, it has nowhere to come from. A boy from, well, maybe not the poorest, but clearly not a rich family, who is quite heavily bullied in the family. Nothing special at school. At the same time, he is sure that he can achieve something. Here he draws, he knows, he will be an artist in the newspaper. At this time, he is sure of it. Moreover, with no support, this confidence did not receive. Later, he said that my father never understood me. He considered me a miserable sheep. That is, it is clear that his father constantly told him, what are you doing? Take care of normal things, prepare for business, and he will be as I want. This trait, of course, is visible throughout his life. 1917, another attempt to start a business by Elias Disney, his father, fails in Kansas City. And then he is offered in Chicago to become a partner in a factory. Well, it's clear that it wasn't a factory. It was a small plant for producing jams, jellies, and so on. And he goes there. Walt, who is 16 years old, also follows his parents, although his older brothers are already living their own lives. He enrolls in a school in Chicago where he doesn't like it. It's very characteristic that literally a few weeks after starting school, he is already the art editor of the school newspaper. So again, he wants to draw, draw, draw. He attends evening courses. That's what he dreams about. But on the other hand, World War I is happening, and in 1917, the United States enters the war. His brother Roy, who was older than him, by eight years, played a very significant role in his life because the two oldest brothers had long since left, and Roy cared for him, protected him, gave him advice. So Roy enlists in the army. Although he didn't really get to fight because Roy was quite ill, he had tuberculosis. But of course, Walt also wants, like his brother, to join the army, and he's trying to enlist. But he's young, 16, 17 years old. He has different stories. In general, there are different stories about how he 
achieved his goals in Chicago, for example, he wanted to work at the post office, but they didn't take him because he was too young. Then he went home, drew himself a mustache, put on a hat instead of a cap, came back, and the same person hired him. Here he tries to bypass the authorities, persuade them to take him. Here he just started looking for his birth certificate. It turned out that he doesn't have one. Hence the version that he struggled all his life thinking that he might be an adopted or illegitimate son. But that's just a version. The fact is, there is no certificate. Then he finds some paper. Then he convinces his parents to give him permission to go and fight. But they don't want to. He forges the signature. In the end, he adds a year to his age. And he is accepted by the Red Cross as a driver. But the war had already ended in 1918. He was still sent to Europe because there were many wounded and disabled there. And the Red Cross had a lot of work to do. And he spent several years in Europe where, by the way, he was drawing all the time. He earned about $600, which was quite a lot for that time, and sent the money to his parents asking them to put it in the bank in his name. He already had some plans related to his future life. His father thought he would return and become a partner in the factory as well. Enter the business, and together they would achieve prosperity. Well, prosperity, of course, never happened. But the main thing was that Walt absolutely did not want to work at this factory. And when he returned, he was already naturally a grown-up, independent man. and immediately told his parents to forget about the business, he would pursue drawing. And he went to Kansas City, where they still had a place to live, where his brothers were at that moment. And he started looking for work. And here, very important things happened. Well, at first, he was nobody. He was hired at some agency where he had to draw advertising brochures and other things. Just then, they fired him, saying, you don't know how to draw, kid. Then he gets a job somewhere else. Later, at some point, he ends up in an advertising agency that produces small advertising videos animated for cinemas, which were completely different from today's advertising and today's videos. They were just a few minutes long. But he starts trying to learn how to do something. He sees how the camera works. He doesn't know anything. The situation, well, is probably complicated and is made easier by the fact that very few people know how to do it. The film industry has only been around for just over two decades, and animation is still developing. There is no animation language yet. It is being created before our eyes. He found a book in the library about how animation works, and he reads it and tries to understand. He asked the owner of the company for an old camera and starts trying to do something in his relative's garage. At this studio, well, it can't even be called a studio in this tiny company where he works. The main method, common at that time, was what is called stop motion, where they made a picture, figures, took a shot, and then moved them to another position, took another shot. So it turned out something similar to movement. Well, many years later, this technique will be used by wonderful animators, for example, in the film Hedgehog in the Fog. But in 1919-20, this was, of course, the very beginning of animation. But he is learning something, trying to do something. At some point, when he was fired once again, he sits with his recently acquired friend, Abby Works, and they discuss what to do. And Disney says, we will create our own company. They have nothing, no name, no money, no experience, but he believes in himself. So there are several important things here. First of all, around this time, after returning from France in 1919, 1920, his goal changed. He no longer wanted to draw pictures, caricatures for newspapers. He decided to become an animator and animation becomes his life. Many years later, he will say that he ate drank, breathed only in the studio and through the studio. This is when he will already have his own studio. Now he is also incredibly passionate and he believes that without money, without connections, without anything, he will still be able to achieve something. 
This faith, by the way, greatly helped him because he walked around Kansas City offering his services to someone there. Let's make a movie for you. Let's do this, let's do that, and let's have you invest money in our company. And he was convincing, although who are you anyway? They start trying to film something, call their company iWorks Disney, because Disney somehow thought that if his surname came first, it would be similar to some dental or cosmetic clinic. And they make huge efforts, shoot something, a little child. They shoot, but in general, nothing really works out. Then they are hired by an advertising animation agency. Then they try to act on their own again. In 1921, they create a company with the wonderful name laugh o -Gram, so we will shoot funny cartoons. But these cartoons only last one minute. After incredible efforts, they manage to negotiate with a network of theatres. Popular, that once a week they would show this little minute. But for them, this was of course already a success. But this success, of course, brought very little money at some point. The dentist asked them to make a film about the importance of brushing teeth, and they made a film about a boy who didn't brush his teeth, and no one wanted to play with him because his teeth all rotted. But those who did brush had a wonderful smile, and they received some money for it, managed to hold on a little longer. But after that, for several years, they literally suffered from hunger and disasters. Sometimes they had nothing. Sometimes they got some small orders, made something, and sometimes it was a complete failure. And sometimes he had to eat scraps and had nowhere to live because, well, at first he lived in this family house because the family moved back to Kansas City. Then they all scattered. He couldn't live there alone and maintain the house. He rented a room. He didn't have money to pay. He didn't pay, didn't pay, didn't pay. The landlady tolerated it. Then he owed 20 fives, which was a very large sum for that time. He moved out and he wandered around the corners and sometimes slept on the street and starved. It was all absolutely terrible, but he still had this seemingly unfounded belief in himself, a belief that it would work out, that everything would be fine. There are many thoughts and assumptions about why Disney was particularly fond of animation. This was the beginning of the 1920s. Cinematography was extremely popular in general. We talked about this in the lecture on the Age Golden. of Hollywood, about how dozens, maybe hundreds of people found jobs in cinematography without any experience, and no one had any experience. So yesterday he was a courier or he was a salesman yesterday or something else, and then he came to Hollywood and became a cameraman, and then made some other career. There are quite a few stories like this. And this new thing, which was not considered so prestigious, was very alluring. Well, of course, in the early post-war years, this kind of halo radiance around cinematography starts to emerge. Why doesn't Disney, who was good at portraying, who obviously had artistic abilities, why doesn't he think about cinema? Why doesn't he try himself in a cinematographic career? Of course, there could be all sorts of explanations, but very often there is an explanation that seems quite convincing. For Disney throughout his entire life, first of all, control was incredibly important. If you're acting in a film, you don't control it. But if you're the director, producer, yes, but that's somehow distant. But still, there are live people there. They can act like this. They can act like that. If you're drawing a world, it's all yours. You create your own world. Many Disney biographers believe that this was important to him. He will create an animated world, and it will be a world of his own. He will live by the rules that he sets. He thinks a lot. He tries to learn about how animation works. And at the same time, different methods are being developed. And this translation is becoming less and less appealing to him, and he just wants to draw more. He understands that you can draw directly on celluloid, on film, and this really attracts him. He learns about various other new methods. And for him, 
throughout his entire life, technical innovations will mean a lot. He watches very popular at that time cartoons by animator Max Fleischer. He shot a series called From the Inkwell, where you could clearly see how they were drawing these ink characters. Next to these characters were real people, sometimes real people, sometimes photographs of real people. So it's a combination of the real world and the drawn. And he decides that he likes this more than just making and rearranging some drawn characters. And he comes up with an idea. He decides to make a film, Alice in Wonderland. Of course, it was not supposed to be an adaptation of Alice, but a story about a certain little girl, little Alice, who ends up in a magical world. Of course, it was a very short film, and he finds a four-year-old girl whose parents are eager for her to get into the movies, and he starts making a film where this girl acts, and next to her, drawn characters. And this will also be an important leap for him, because before that, it seems like he was trying to draw a complete Little Red Riding Hood, but nothing is clear here, it didn't survive. But here he found some kind of combination of reality and fantasy, which will also be very important for him. Throughout his entire creative life, as we will see on the one hand, he created amazing, fantastic worlds. And on the other hand, he wanted to make them more and more realistic, such directly opposite desires. And now he tries to make these films, but somehow especially no one needs it. He frantically looks for someone to take these films for distribution, exhibitors. But for some reason, no one is interested. No matter how they save, they shoot themselves in some roles for the last pennies. Well, it doesn't work out. And at this time, by the beginning of the 1920s, Hollywood already means a lot. It is clear to everyone that Hollywood is becoming the center of the film industry. And especially in California, in Los Angeles at that time, his brother Roy, who is being treated for tuberculosis there. Disney decides to go to his brother. He buys, with some last money, characteristically, a ticket for first class on the train. And he always believed that you should travel first class, and apparently he shocked and surprised everyone with his shabby clothes, his pale, emaciated appearance. But he traveled first class. He arrives at his brother's, but he needs to look for work. On the one hand, it seems like he's walking around the city looking for work as a salesman, delivery person, janitor, anyone. Roy later said that Walt pretended to look for work. He didn't want to work at all. Maybe that's true. Maybe he really couldn't find any, but he doesn't find any work because his mind is occupied with something else. It's occupied with animation and he goes to different studios and all these great studios are forming. He comes, offers something, of course. Nobody needs him. He tries to show his films shot in Kansas City. Nobody's interested in that. Then it seems like luck smiles at him, although in reality for several decades. You can tell the story of Disney's life in such a way that happiness smiled at him and then it failed again. But he hopes every time he believes in himself. In addition to trying to make a connection in Hollywood, he sends his films to New York and there he also tries. to correspond with different producers, with different distributors. Nobody wants to. And then he makes contact with a woman. In the 1910s, in the early 1920s, there was still an opportunity for women to produce, to be involved in actual production. Then, of course, they will be pushed aside in Hollywood for many years. But here's a woman named Margaret Winkler. She lived in New York, was associated with various studios, and she tried to become a distributor herself. She ordered films herself, and she was looking for new talent. And he sends her his Alice. She doesn't really like it, but she feels there's something there. And then she writes to him, yes, I'm ready to collaborate with you, but you need to make it funnier. 
The camera should be more stable, not shaky. Fix this, this, and this. There will be quite a long correspondence after that. Disney, of course, is incredibly encouraged. He does something for her. She keeps giving him instructions all the time. Fix this, this. He fixes it and hopes and waits and already receives some money from her. But in order to send her Alice's, and he told her that he will have a series of films about Alice and kind of hinted that she already has them and he doesn't. So he needs some kind of space. It can be called a studio, although it will be called that. He needs a place, he needs equipment, he needs at least some employees, but there is no money at all. He bursts into the hospital, into the ward where his brother is lying and says, get discharged immediately, everyone, we got an order. The brother, as it happens, got discharged and will be his faithful assistant. Then they go around all the relatives, close friends, acquaintances. They write to Kansas City. They ask everyone for money. And again, his ability to persuade was so great, or maybe his charm, that quite a few relatives and close friends gave, well, someone 30, 50. So they collected a little money here and there. Of course, their rich Uncle Robert played the main role all the time. But he thought it was complete nonsense. That's enough. Go get a normal job. But he persuaded him and he gave him $500. And this was the most important moment. They create a studio, which will initially be called Disney Brothers Studio. And then he told his brother, you know, I decided that it would be better to call it Walt Disney Studio, he said, okay. And from now on, Walt will always be in the lead roles. He will have a larger number of shares. He will make all the decisions. And Roy will be dealing with the money, with the organization, which was very difficult. So encouraged, Walt begins to draw his Alice's. They are taken from him. Margaret Winkler gets them. She also gives various comments expresses, which he tries to take into account. The distribution starts, he gets some small money. There is never enough money. It's just always a problem. It will be a problem later when he already will be a famous animator and even more so here. And then at some point she writes to him that no, the Alice's are not doing well. No one is really watching them. Theaters don't want to order them. That's it. We're breaking up. We don't need any more Alice's. Disney sat for a day in his office, not leaving, thinking about something there. Well, then he starts suggesting some new ideas. And this is already the mid-1920s, a time when cinema is becoming increasingly important in people's lives. Animation is also becoming more and more popular, although, of course, no one thinks of coming separately to watch cartoons. They only last a few minutes. They are usually shown before a big movie. Well, what was called a magazine in Soviet times. The idea becomes quite widespread, which arises in different places among different animators, that if live action movies capture people, we can draw anyone, we can draw little animals, we can draw some fantastic creatures, and it becomes fashionable to draw adventures of rabbits, cats, dogs, and so on. Disney comes up with Oswald the Rabbit and starts offering these little films with some funny adventures of this rabbit, which apparently Winkler takes from him again. But at this time, a number of important changes occur. Firstly, in 1925, Disney marries to support his family, but he would have coped with that much more difficult for him is the fact that Margaret Winkler is marrying a very tough, cold man named Charles Mintz. Unlike Disney's wife, Winkler gets pregnant quite quickly and hands over all the business to her husband. And dealing with him was much more difficult than with her because he was cold, calculating and immune to Disney's charm and he cheated like many others who tried to profit from Disney. Oswald the Lucky Rabbit becomes quite popular and some money starts coming in for the studio and they can continue working, but they have to keep churning out new films about this rabbit. At some point, Disney stops. 
At a gas station and in the store, he sees that there is a chocolate bar with the image of this. Rabbit, meaning behind his back mince, and also there was Jack Winkler, Margaret's brother. They launched what is called merchandising, and he knows nothing about it. They have some negotiations with the studio. Universal also hiding everything from him. He doesn't understand anything. He should only deliver the pictures and get the money they give him. In 1928, Disney and his wife went to New York, and he intended to meet with Mintz and ask him to pay more for the films. He is convinced, as always, that he will succeed. He knows that this rabbit is quite popular, so surely everything will be fine. He comes to Mintz. First of all, he tells him he doesn't even discuss he just informs that he will pay less for each film. And moreover, most of the animators that Disney has already hired are now moving to Mintz. And the rights to the rabbit figure turns out to be at Universal Studios, which seems to be completely unexpected. Disney can stay and work for Mintz for less money and accept this situation. Mintz was in complete shock. He just stood up and left without a word. The next day, he and his wife Lillian left for California, and he sat silently. All the way, looking out the window, tapping his fingers on the table, thinking. And at some point, he started thinking about how to get rid of this cabal. We don't know how Mickey Mouse was invented, or rather, we know many different versions. The main version is that sitting on this train, he started thinking about the fact that he needed a completely new project. He needed to create some new creature that wouldn't belong to Mintz or any other studio and develop this character. Why a mouse? We don't know. There are also different versions that there was a mouse running around his studio that he caught it once, put it in a cage, made it his friend. And other information on the contrary that he was terribly afraid of mice. It's completely unclear. But it seems that he always dreamed of making such a cute little mouse. It's unclear why. And at first he came up with the name Mortimer for her, but his wife said no, it's a girly name, what is this? And then they called him Mickey, the son of Abiwerks, who actually drew Mickey Mouse first, said no, my father came up with Mickey. And Walt was standing behind him and watching. But Iwerks was drawing although we know that Disney also made some sketch, though this little mouse turned out to be too much like him. And in the spring of 1928, secret work begins on the first Mickey Mouse film. Why secret? Because he's terribly afraid that, for example, Mintz will find out about it. The thing is that those animators that Mintz lured to himself, they are still working with Disney, and he is terribly afraid that they will see it. Then they will leave in a month or two to Mintz and take this idea, which is not yet patented. So they sit in the studio. These traitors are drawing the remaining films. About Oswald the Rabbit, which he still has to produce. And closing himself in another room sits Ab Iwerks, who is drawing some mysterious little mouse. And this, by the way, is a huge effort because he didn't just create the project. He has to draw a huge amount of different poses of Mickey. And there he made 700 drawings a day, Iwerks. And they released the first film, Playing Crazy. At this moment, Charles Lindbergh is making his flights. He is very popular. So they send Mickey on a plane. They shoot the second film. And the films are doing well, they are being shown, everything is fine. And then comes the most important turning point. They are already preparing the third film, Steamboat Willie. And at this moment, Disney, along with other cinematographers, is at the screening of the film, The Jazz Singer, the first sound film. We also talked about it in the lectures about Hollywood, about how very different cinematographers met the very idea of using sound. As Mary Pickford said, sound in cinema is like painting the Venus de Milo with lipstick. 
and many silent films. And as for animators, could not adapt. today it is very difficult for us to imagine an animated film without sound. But at that time, many considered, apart from all the technical difficulties, animation and, Disney, and drawings, who immediately and drawings reacted to such actors are live people. Understood so it is that more it or less natural. To be used. What will our drawings he say? He returns How? to his studio. He says. We are completely redoing Steamboat Willie. We. will make it with sound. Someone objects. Someone says it's impossible. No, there will be sound. At the same time, no one even understands how to do it. He searches for equipment for a very long time. There were also various options for sound recording at that time. He finds a producer, Pat Powers, who has a license for using sound. Recording equipment. He comes to the conclusion that this particular sound recording works best of all, and he signs a contract with Powers. They are somewhat bewildered because no one understands how to connect this, how to draw, with sound, how to do it, how to make everything synchronous. Disney wants any movement of Mickey Mouse and other characters, jumps. Some falls to be accompanied by sounds. But how to coordinate? There was a man at his studio whose mother was a music teacher, and he said, you need to set a metronome. They set a metronome that beat the rhythm, and they were able to coordinate. And he hires a composer, and the music starts playing, and Mickey says his first words, hot dogs, hot dogs, he said and a revolution happens. And they come up with some sounds of a saw, some where he tickles Minnie. His mouse and banjo sounds are heard and something else. On November 18th, 1928, at a New York theater, an animated film is shown. Steamboat Willie, which naturally was not the main feature of this showing, it is shown before a big feature film. But first of all, it turns out that the audience is completely amazed. Secondly, the theater owner invited many journalists to this show saying, oh, it's going to be something special. And they were all excited too. Here's the sound, a little mouse running around. There's music and something else. And they all wrote about it. And a grand procession of Mickey Mouse begins at first only in the United States. Everyone wants to see and hear him. They quickly make a lot of films. At first, they are short films, a lot of films. And then Mickey appears and Minnie appears and some other, other, other adventures of theirs. There are not even any special plots yet. It's just a collection of gags, a collection of tricks, jumps, hits on the head and with sound. And Mickey Mouse becomes incredibly popular. Over the next few years, the number of people watching Mickey Mouse is already measured in millions in America and then also abroad. Mickey Mouse clubs emerge. Someone said that by the age of 33, the number of Mickey Mouse club members was greater than the number of Boy Scouts in America. So these were kids who there, they wore something that looked like Mickey. They made some vows. Mickey Mouse, don't smoke, don't lie, don't be rude to anyone. In general, such a pioneer, an example for all the kids. Mickey Mouse parades are organized and he becomes incredibly popular. The question arises, what actually made this silly little mouse so popular with everyone? Of course, it was completely unexpected. It was fun. It was at the forefront of all achievements. Absolutely right. There is such a few, maybe sly version, that at this moment, the end of the 1920s, beginning of the 1930s, Hollywood loses some of its such a lofty image. We also talked about it in the lecture on Hollywood, that during the 1920s, there are several, even quite a few scandals. Someone dies, someone overdoses. 
on drugs, someone gets shot, marital infidelity. So Hollywood becomes such a symbol of immorality in a rather puritanical America. Let's not forget at all that this is the time of prohibition. Moreover, on the one hand, the stars behave, and not only the stars, in general, everyone involved in the film industry behave from the point of view of these stern moralists incorrectly. And what do they show in the movies? There are some love stories. There are some fights going on. Something wrong is happening in general. And one of Disney's biographers has such a theory that Disney with his middle American background, unlike all these numerous Jewish producers, of all the major studios with his strict morals, with his ideas about morality, proposed a new hero. I mean, this is not some kind of femme fatale from a love movie or a cowboy who constantly shoots, but this is completely an asexual little mouse. All his courting of Minnie consists of singing her a song. At the same time, he is cheerful, jumps, bounces, gets into any situation. This turned out to be a manifestation of some new Hollywood, more moral. And according to this historian, Mickey Mouse therefore received such support. I don't know, maybe it was just something lively, new, unexpected. It's very interesting that as his popularity grew, Mickey changed. I mean, he looked different at first. He was much more like a little mouse. Then gradually they started to make him more and more human and he became more like a boy than a mouse. Softer forms appeared. Before that, he was much more angular. His behavior changed very much. At first, he was constantly getting into some complicated situations and thanks to his agility, ability to hit someone on the head, run away, he managed to get out of them. Sometimes he even became aggressive. From the mid 1930s, he became softer, calmer, he no longer resembled this perpetually getting out of his problems chaplain. He became different. But it is very characteristic that, well, everyone is interested in watching hooliganism. So at some point, they came up with a quite unpleasant Donald Duck. For some reason, everyone immediately said, oh, this is Harold Ickes, Secretary of the Interior under Roosevelt. They didn't like him, so he's just as unpleasant. And Donald Duck will do some mischief, it is obvious necessary. But Mickey went in the direction of being more sweet. His popularity was incredible. And then they started making money. They got the opportunity to continue working. They started developing other options. A long series begins, which will go on for many years under the name Silly Symphony. But for some reason, they translate it as naive symphonies. Although, in fact, these are silly symphonies where animators get the opportunity to do what the creators of game movies certainly cannot do. A Disney plants flowers, birds and animals dance, anything goes. In this world, he can do anything. The film from this series of symphonies called The Dance of the Skeletons makes an incredible impression on everyone. There is no plot, just 12 skeletons rising from the graves and dancing to specially written music. And then transitioning to Grieg's music, juggling bones and using each other as xylophones, violating all laws of physics, if only because skeletons cannot dance. But even as they dance, they jump, transition from one to another. They and all sorts of things happen there. It was absolutely delightful. American game movies were, of course, absolutely fantastic. In the sense that a simple girl married a millionaire, a cowboy. Defeated 500 enemies and so on. However, they still acted in a somewhat more or less realistic world. But here, you could do anything you wanted. It's very interesting that at some point, Disney tried to find support from the main Hollywood studio, Metro Golden Mayer. And Louis Mayer came to watch his films, sat in the screening room. And at first they showed him one of the silly symphonies. He said, what is this? 
Men and women dance, boys and girls dance, but flowers, trees don't dance. I don't understand this. Even though there were many wonders happening in the films at his studio, but not like these. Then they started showing him Mickey Mouse, and this really outraged him because he jumped up and said, many pregnant they women to come have to our more. films. All women are afraid of mice, especially if this mouse is huge. Many feet on the screen. We won't have that. Music. In these films, fewer words, there's no need for words because it's all just running around jumping and but it's easier for them to enter the international market. And soon Mickey Mouse is already being watched all over the world. Then there are several more events at Disney all the time, hooray, and it collapses. First of all, in 1929, just when Mickey Mouse's fame begins, the economic crisis begins, which will lead to the Great Depression in America. Well, we also talked in lectures about Hollywood that the first years for Hollywood were even good. Tickets were quite cheap at the movies, and for many it was a consolation, even, for the unemployed to go and sit, watch something about the beautiful life. On the other hand, all labor became very cheap labor, and this was also advantageous. And for Disney, to some extent, this was advantageous too, because, well, as he becomes more famous, more and more people want to work for him, and in general, are willing to do it literally for pennies. And at that moment, no one really thinks about it. And when he, say, announces that salaries will be cut by 15%, because in New York, the unemployed are sleeping on the street, no one objects. Everyone understands that if you object, you'll be fired. You won't have any salary. That's one thing. But at the same time, the situation arises, which surprisingly will constantly repeat. Popularity is growing, but there is no money. But Disney had so many ideas all the time, so many plans. It expanded so quickly. It wanted to use all the technical innovations. It always needed a lot of money, and it gets them not very much. And they suspect with Roy that this very Pat Powers, who gave them the opportunity to make sound films, who signed a contract with them, is doing something shady they can't track in how many theaters their cartoons are being shown. But in general, they are getting reports from all sides that people are watching them, seeing them. Newspapers are writing about them. There is little money. Disney goes to powers in New York to collect the rights, and it turns out that he has no rights at all. He says, as much as there is money, that's how much I pay. If you don't want to, fine, we'll break the contract. But you still owe me quite a lot more films to shoot. And also, besides that, I'm losing Abby Works, that is his chief animator, and he will be drawing for me. This was a terrible blow for Disney because they have been friends for a long time. They have been collaborating for many years. They have been through a lot. And he always considered him a traitor. Although Iverx's son said, obviously expressing his father's opinion that his father was very underestimated, that he created Mickey Mouse and he is not in the credits. But everyone sees, first of all, Disney's signature on the screen. But in Hollywood, for a long time, there were no credits at all. Then they wrote something there. But the main success, of course, was going to Disney in this case, although it is unclear what his role was. Iverx leaves and Powers made a deal with him that he creates his own studio and works for him. Disney understands that the situation is difficult. He starts looking for another distributor but understands that whoever takes him now will have to sue Powers because they have a contract. And he also finds such a legendary producer from Columbia Pictures Studio, a man named Harry Cohn, who was called the meanest man in Hollywood. He was rude, rough, mean, nasty. Before him, everyone trembled. His servants 
when they went to his office, so to speak, to the carpet, the corridor that led to his office, they called the last mile. That's it, my life is ending. And Harry Cohn, he looked, got interested. He consulted with various people he trusted. In particular, there was such a famous director, Frank Capra, who really liked Mickey Mouse. He said, yes, yes, yes. And he took their trial with powers. Nothing, nothing will sue. And they agreed to pay him a ransom there. And now Cohn becomes the distributor for Disney, which was also not easy because Cohn generally paid money when he thought it was necessary. And as much as he thought was necessary, but to demand from him, that was more trouble than it was worth. So they had to grit their teeth, come up with some, do more and more of these little cartoons, try to earn money, which was always in short supply. Here they come up with several moves. First of all, somewhere here in the early 1930s, the Disney brothers realize that they can sell their merchandise and they hire a person who creates a huge income for them. Figures of Mickey Mouse appear and clothing. Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse comics and not only Mickey Mouse, but also other characters who have already appeared here and Donald Duck and Goofy and Pluto the dog. All this turns into such a huge commercial empire that helps them stay afloat. Although Disney, of course, wants to focus only on creativity, but they got the money. Another thing, starting from 1932, he constantly thinks about the possibility of using color. By this time, the idea of color film has already been quite developed, but not everyone wants to do it. Firstly, it's expensive. Secondly, color films quickly fade at that time. And accordingly, for example, re-releasing a film becomes problematic. This does not stop Disney. He negotiates with the Technicolor Company, which sets up the technology for creating color cartoons for him. He says, finally, we can draw a rainbow. Disney shouts in excitement and his films become colorful. This, of course, also greatly increases their popularity. And the next breakthrough moment is 1933, when the cartoon The Three Little Pigs is released. Today, it seems simple. There's nothing special about it. Well, the song, of course, is all good. It was another revolution carried out by Disney. Naturally, it was sound. Naturally, it was in color. That's understandable. But there were a few more moments that weren't there before. All these numerous stories about Mickey, Donald and company, all these naive symphonies, they were just a collection of gags, a collection of some tricks running around, jumping, very often like in a dance of skeletons. There was no plot at all. In The Three Little Pigs, of course, there is a plot, beginning, middle, end, its development. It may be simple, but it's there, it's a story. And another thing, in The Three Little Pigs, there are characters. From this moment on, Disney will demand more and more from its employees that everyone they draw has character. If it's a tree, what is it thinking about? If this is a piano, what does it feel when Mickey plays on it? They discussed it for hours in the studio and Disney controlled absolutely all production. At that moment, all the frames were shown to him, all the sketches, all the ideas, everything was discussed, sometimes incredibly long redone and discussed again and with the three little pigs. So he wants each pig to have its own character, the wolf to have its own character. They become, well, it's probably funny to say that they become human to some extent, of course. And of course, no one suspected how popular the song would become, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf. It was sung everywhere. It was broadcast on the radio. Orchestras played it. It literally became a symbol of Disney and of course brought him an incredible amount of fame. And from that moment on, first of all, the character of all the heroes will always be discussed. The story will always be detailed described. Before that, the script even in the game movies, not to mention animation. It could be a piece of paper, the hero goes here, there, the end. 
at Disney, what is now called a storyboard appears when they detailedly create the entire story from drawings, when they discuss all the twists, turns, and so on. And now he understands the huge role that music plays. One of the animators who worked at Disney Studio later recalled, for American animation, the three little pigs became a turning point. At first, in Disney films, the appearance of the heroes defined them. The three little pigs looked roughly. The same, but each of them acted differently. Each had their own personality. Disney still constantly explaining, or rather trying to explain to his employees what he wants from them. He couldn't very clearly assign tasks to them. Everyone said that but he acted out the entire future cartoon in front of them for each character he spoke. Sometimes he even brought them out already when he did this many, many times. Sometimes grown men cried with delight watching his stories and his play. Someone said it was no less than what Chaplin did and Chaplin, as I already mentioned, they watched all the time and were guided by him. The Three Little Pigs was released in 1933. It was a very difficult year. Reforms were just beginning. There were many unemployed. The situation in the country was sad. The song, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, was perceived as a kind of anthem during the Depression era. But we are not afraid of the big bad wolf. There is even a version that the famous phrase of Roosevelt about having nothing to fear. But fear itself was inspired by this song. Well, it can't be verified, but the assumption exists. There are even discussions about how Significant the role of the Three Little Pigs cartoon was in the fight against the Great Depression. Well, the answer is, of course, very significant. The company United Artists, which was responsible for distributing the Three Little Pigs, they couldn't print new copies fast enough. The theatres were lining up. It was a kind of madness. A lot of money was earned, and from that moment on, what one historian wrote about. The deification of Disney, because he was awarded medals, prizes, he was invited to banquets where everyone made toasts in his honor. There was complete madness around him. Perhaps indeed this was also exacerbated by depression. When everything was so bad and then a person appeared who made such a cheerful film, we are not afraid of the big bad wolf. We will still win. And this had an incredible impact on everyone. One journalist wrote addressing Disney, Hollywood is going crazy for you. The only thing I can blame you for is that you make fewer films than I would like. If it were up to me, I would hand over all the studios to you and make you shoot all the films on them. I would propose to introduce a new code for films. At this moment in Hollywood, the notorious Hayes Code is in effect, which closely monitors what can be shown on the screen, what cannot be shown. He says, I would introduce into the new code so that there is always a little music in the film and there would be a large choir consisting of producers, distributors, screenwriters who would sing, who's afraid of the NRA? This is the Roosevelt administration, which is carrying out reforms. And at the head of the choir would be Willie, Mickey Hayes. Willie Hayes is the man who created this code, overseeing order in Hollywood. He's a go-getter. He's accepted into such exclusive clubs. He's involved in the most prestigious form of Hollywood sport, polo, and immediately decides that all his employees will learn horseback riding to also play polo, and so on and so forth. However, at this time, the first accusations of anti-Semitism had already emerged seemingly linked to this innocent cartoon. The problem was that when the wolf approaches the third pig's house and tries to deceive them, he pretends to be an innocent merchant. In the first version, it was a Jewish merchant, and the wolf transformed into such a caricatured Jew who seemed to be trying to sell his goods through the door Many perceive this as an expression of anti-Semitism, although, of course, the question is, it's just a wolf pretending to be someone good. But in any case, Disney removed the wolf's Jewishness 
In the final version, he was just a merchant. This debate about Disney's anti-Semitism continues to this day. Who tried to crush his studio for so long. And here he is like a wolf blowing at the little house, but he can't get anything done. Carl Lemmel was Jewish, like most of the Hollywood producers. And Disney, of course, had this feeling that the big studios were suffocating him and not allowing him to develop. How much of this feeling was just an insult? Or was it anti-Semitism? Well, I have the feeling that for him, of course, on a personal level, there was anti-Semitism because he made jokes, said nasty things, just like his father did before him. It's a typical situation in general for a boy who grew up in the province. On the other hand, it was said later that he did not hire Jews at the studio, that he fired. People, even those who managed to get in as Jews, he fired them. There are directly opposite statements. On the contrary, he defended Jews. It's all very unclear. We know that Disney was friends with Henry Ford, who was a notorious anti-Semite, who believed in a Jewish Masonic conspiracy, who liked Hitler and all that kind of thing. How much this friendship was based on unity of views, it's hard to say. We know that Disney in the 1930s attended meetings of such extreme right-wing nationalist organizations, and he clearly liked them. Even worse, in my opinion, is that in 1938, shortly after Kristallnacht, that is after this wave of pogroms that swept through Hitler's Germany, Disney hosted Lenny Riefenstahl at his studio and showed her around. This caused incredible outrage when it became known. He explained that he didn't even know who she was. Well, she came, asked for some. German filmmaker, I had to maintain the German market, so I showed her. Well, it's hard to judge how true this is, the question remains. Indeed, in 1955, one of the largest Jewish public organizations gave Disney the title of Man of the Year. And before they did that, they... At this moment, Disney is already being called a genius, a person who revolutionized animation. He really took animation to a new level. It began to be perceived as art, not just as cheap entertainment. The question is, what is his role or what is the role of the people who worked for him? This is a very complex, very painful question. And there is no single opinion here either. The fact that Disney consistently achieved that all the glory for his films went to him is undoubtedly true. The fact that there were either no credits at all or small credits appeared somewhere. But first everyone saw that a stylized signature appeared on the screen. Walt Disney presents, he presents, that's what it means. More and more people are working for him. He himself, of course, no longer draws anything. Animators work, screenwriters work, musicians work, many other people work, performing various technical tasks. He keeps everything under control, that's for sure. He sits with everyone, endlessly verifying stories, checking, reviewing, or does it just speak of his despotism? Disney was always criticized for being paternalistic towards its employees. Well, like towards little children. He never said my employees, my workers. He said my boys, my girls. And this seems to indicate that they are all one family. But here's a very complex issue. Mussolini also believed that entrepreneurs and workers should be like one family. In this family, of course, you couldn't argue with him. In this family, everything was done, as he said. That is, he could listen, but mostly, in general, of course, he preferred people. To agree with him and simply develop his ideas, he cared a lot about his employees. But this meant, for example, that bonuses, salary increases were given to those he wanted to give them to. 
but he gave them for some reasons of his own. This one works well, so he will receive a lot. Next to him, a person who does the same. Work, but receives much less. Well, because daddy thinks differently. He says, but everyone calls me Walt. It's easier for me if everyone calls me Walt, and that way I don't have to give them a raise. He said calmly and cynically. Maybe it was a joke. He believed that those he valued, he would give a raise. Sometimes the difference in salaries between people doing the same job was huge. And he watched their manners. He watched their behavior. For him, it was completely normal to practically live in the studio. In 1933, his daughter was born. And after some time, they also adopted a girl. And he loved them both very much. But of course, when there are little children at home, it complicates things too. He often came home then, went to the studio late at night. They could go out with his wife for a walk. And he would say, listen, I forgot, I need to stop by the studio. They would go to the studio and he would get stuck there. She would lie down on the couch, fall asleep, then open her eyes, ask what time it was. He would say, it's not too late yet. He even sometimes changed the clock so she wouldn't notice. And he continued to work. And then she stays at home with the children. He works around the clock, goes everywhere. And for him, it seemed just as normal that everyone else should work the same way. And when they had an emergency, and they had emergencies regularly, people worked 12-hour shifts on Saturdays, on Sundays, naturally. Without receiving any extra pay for their overtime, there was no talk about it. They were all one family. But if you suddenly somehow upset the boss. Well, there was a story when during a long meeting, someone said, you know, it's already been 12 hours. Maybe we should take a lunch break. He was fired. There was a completely wild story when they were celebrating his birthday at the studio in a solemn manner. And this whole big family gathers and they make toasts. Congratulate, dear Walt. Everyone is happy. But a few animators made a humorous film in which Mickey Mouse was making love to Minnie. Everyone watched, everyone laughed a lot. Disney was laughing too. Then he stood up and said, I would like to know the names of those who made this wonderful film. People joyfully jumped up. He said, you are fired and left. And this also happened as one of the people who also worked at Disney said he was able to brilliantly use someone else's genius. And here's the question. Does this mean that he appropriated someone else's fame or is it a special genius that he could gather them and understand what needed to be done and distribute the tasks correctly? I don't know. In 1934, when Disney was basking in glory in a Hollywood newspaper, there appeared a letter signed animator. Well, that is anonymous, which said, although we owe Disney a lot of thanks, we owe even more thanks to those who do the real work. After all, they make the movies. This article was read aloud during lunch break at the studio. Many laughed, applauded, and a few days later, a letter appeared condemning this animator signed by a former animator, a former Disney employee, explaining the great role of Mr. Disney but there were rumors that he wrote it himself letter, but of course no one can check. But he continued his actions. He continued to pay the salary as he saw fit. And if there was no money, he would come. All the women adored him at the studio. He would come and say, all the girls are going on a week's vacation, but unpaid. They still thanked him. Thank you very much. And in this way, he would get rid of a large number of employees for a week. But at this time, this, well, we can say tyrant, we can say paternalist, we can say caring employer, we can say exploiter. At this time, Walt Disney is thinking about where to go next. He doesn't want to stand still. He found something completely new with the three little pigs. That animation can develop with the story. It can be psychological. It can... Tell a story, evoke feelings of the audience. He wants to develop it somehow. He considered many different projects. He thought of returning to the option of actors plus drawing. He discussed with Mary. 
Pickford had the opportunity to make a film where Pickford would play Alice in Wonderland. Well, she was no longer young, but she always had the role of an ingenue, a girl. So she would be Alice and the others would be risky characters. But at that moment, they released the movie Alice. So he considers some other options. And finally, in 1934, he makes a historic decision. He decides that his studio will adapt the Grimm Brothers fairy tale, Snow White, that it will be a feature film which had never been done before. All animated films were short. They might have been a minute, but it could be seven minutes, 10 minutes. No one could imagine that. People would come to the theater and sit for an hour, an hour and a half, two hours watching. Just an animated film, it was incredible. So he decides to make a feature film. He decides it will be Snow White. The main studio's forces are thrown into this work over the course of several years. I think this film should be renamed Frankenstein Frankenstein is a monster who killed his own creator because they were in debt. A representative of Bank of America, their main creditor at the time, was very unhappy about it. And once again, he came to tell them to stop this outrage. They showed him a piece of the film and supposedly he was so delighted that he said, that's it, keep going guys, this will bring you a lot of money. Then he developed several completely innovative approaches. First, he left a certain number of people who continued to make short, small films to bring in money. And he divided all those who worked on Snow White according to a very interesting principle. He assigned a specific character to a certain group. So there were people responsible for Snow White and there were those responsible for the evil queen and someone else for the dwarves and so on. So it's not like a team working on a scene. There were different people drawing different characters. They didn't work sequentially. At the same time, there were absolutely exhausting, endless discussions. The fairy tale Snow White exists in different versions. They were analyzing these versions and considering whether they should stage a scene where the evil queen captures the prince and puts him in prison. Should they stage this terrible story about how the queen dances in red hot shoes and dies at the end. Well, thank God they didn't do that. They discuss every little detail. He delves into all of this. They discuss the music. They discuss, oh, here's the queen. What will she be like? Like a witch or like she appears in the movie? Such a dark beauty. It's not by chance that the mirror first says that she's the fairest of them all. What will the dwarfs be like? Again, this is his. Striving for psychological depth. They endlessly discuss the names of the dwarfs. There were many different options. Each of them should have their own individuality. So before they even started drawing, there was some fantastic preparatory work. They look at animals, the incredible amount of drawings, sculptures, images of gnomes. Examine, think about what their gnomes will be like, how to depict Snow White. They invited a young dancer who had to perform various graceful movements so that they following this would draw Snow White. All this was of course, wild work and wild money. Technical innovations were developed at the same time. They had been invented before, but they started using and developing what was later called a multiplane camera. When they separately filmed the foreground, middle ground, background, and moved these planes, composed, it was quite a complex operation, but it gave them the opportunity to create depth in their drawing. So again, to make this fantastic world real. At that time in Hollywood, there was such an institute as Nelbert Schwinar, a woman who created art courses. He sends his people there first, then conversely he 
where on the one hand, his employees are already studying. And on the other hand, he invites talented people from these courses, from this Srinar Institute to work for him. Here, there are also very different assessments. Some say that this is how he was casting a net, catching talents so that they all would come to work for him. Another version is that he took young, untrained, completely unprepared, because he had to pay them less. Who is right, I don't know, but in any case, he really paid little, but really among them, there were many talented people. Time is running out. It's impossible to shoot for so long. They of course have a promotional campaign and all that. A year passes, two, three. They work in three shifts. He divided everyone into groups and work. Practically goes on around the clock. He himself, he leaves in the evening, then suddenly at night comes, walks around the studio, examines the desks of different animators, and they redo and discuss again and again. And in Snow White, he succeeded more than anything else in bringing the image to some absolute... Today, direction. Snow White looks incredibly sweet, of course, but at the same time, of course, great skill is evident here. And in December 1937, when it premiered, Snow White made an incredible impression. There was a storm of enthusiasm. Awards were showered upon him. It's impossible to list them all. At the Oscar ceremony, he was given a special prize, consisting of a large Oscar statuette and seven Him an honorary ones. doctor, Harvard Yale. made... Made him an honorary doctor. Because he created a new language of animation, and there's no arguing with that. However, this image of his community working together began to crack a little. After the triumphant premiere, the incredibly successful premiere of Snow White, Disney decided that the whole studio should be rewarded, and he took them all to a hotel on the lake for the weekend. Celebrate home. their success together in a friendly manner. And then naturally, everyone started He prohibited drinking in the studio, but he can't do that here. So everyone got drunk there. There were some couples, of course, immediately formed. Someone ran naked to swim in that lake. Well, there was such a, they went on a corporate picnic. They all had fun. The next morning, Disney woke up in a rage, got in the car with his wife and kids, drove away, never mentioned it again. And that was the first sign that this is not exactly the ideal brotherhood that you imagine, but he didn't understand that then. After Snow White, Disney, of course, was already considered a god. He had a lot of money. And he started building a new studio. In the press release, it is specifically stated that Mr. Disney always thinks about the well-being of his employees and everything here will be done for them. It's much more spacious with large rooms with many amenities, air conditioners everywhere in every office, separate toilet, there is a coffee shop, there is a gym, there is a room for recording. Music, there are great studios for shooting. So everything is absolutely wonderful for work. Well, really on the roof, there are sun lounges, you can sunbathe. but it's called the penthouse club. First of all, women are clearly not allowed there. Men sunbathe naked and not everyone is allowed in, only the management. This is just one detail showing that there is no community, friends or family. Even physically Disney who used to sit, well, maybe not in the same room as everyone else, but nearby, walked everywhere. Everyone said hi to him. Walt, hi, hi. And now he's sitting on the top floor. You can't just approach him. You have to go through the secretary. So somehow he distanced himself from them. And later when conflicts arise, many will say that's all because of the new studio. They built this building and where is Walt now? And he's neglecting us. Of course, it wasn't about the studio. It was about some things which were there before, but previously were forgiven. Maybe there were fewer of them. 
maybe. And somehow the relationships were really more family-like. Anyway, there were plenty of people who literally worshipped him. But this feeling of authoritarianism of his decisions, and most importantly, not just authoritarianism, but also complete inexplicability. I give so much to this, so much to this, and no explanations. All this control of morals by him that whoever swears can be fired and much more. It all started to irritate, but he doesn't notice it yet and is naturally engaged in creativity. He wants to move forward. And what is, of course, very important for Disney, he is always looking for something new. When else? The Three Little Pigs appeared, and he was offered to make some continuation of The Three Little Pigs. He said, you can't surpass pigs with the help of pigs. And indeed, he created Snow White, completely new in relation to The Three Little Pigs. And what to do now? What would be better than Snow White now? Well, he understands. That is, he has proven to the whole world that it is possible to make long, full-length animated films, and they will be successful. So he wants to continue making big films. That is, the small ones that bring in income are still being made. But work on powerful, big projects is beginning. What is characteristic is that after this, all of his grandiose films, Pinocchio, Bambi, Dumbo, they will all bring huge losses to the studio. That is, everything will be at a loss. He will stay afloat thanks to merchandise, short films, credits, and his name, and the big projects will all be unprofitable. But he needed to move forward somehow. He needed to develop. He wants to show that animation is truly a great art. Over the next few years, work primarily goes into two big films, Pinocchio and the completely unexpected film Fantasia, and both will be released in 1940. Naturally, they will generate a lot of interest. Critics will write a lot of good things about them. But they will not elicit the universal enthusiasm that Snow White did. Times have changed. The films have become different. Pinocchio, well, we like to say that Buratino is the Russian version of Pinocchio. In reality, the fairy tales are quite different. And what Disney did was also different from the book. And if in Snow White, there was some light and belief in the victory of good, love, even if it's sugary, but still, and in the midst of depression, it was absolutely necessary for people. And in Pinocchio, many biographers see this as the legacy of a religious father. And many generations of Puritans who stand behind him. When the main emphasis Pinocchio wants, he doesn't want to be just a wooden boy. He wants to gain a soul. And in order to obtain this soul, he has to make a great effort. And this moral message contained in Pinocchio, well, firstly, it's not as encouraging as in Snow White. Here it turns out that in Snow White, everyone holds on to each other, saves each other, loves each other, and therefore opposes evil. And here it turns out that you have to constantly work, work on yourself, and then maybe something will work out for you. This also seemed quite strange, especially since he still strived, strived, strived for perfection and constantly exceeded the budget. An even more strange film turned out to be Fantasia, which in my opinion, really shows how extraordinary his thinking was. On the other hand, this film, I try to imagine what people in 1940 must have felt when watching this film. There were some journalists who wrote, oh, I barely escaped from this nightmare, while others wrote the opposite, that it was absolutely brilliant. I think everyone was completely bewildered. Later, I formulated this for myself, that perhaps Fantasia is a completely art house project, completely different from what is associated with Disney, which is realized with completely mainstream methods. Suddenly, after all these years of talking about the need for a story length and plot development, 
They were occupied with this, detailing the plot in every detail. And now he did the following. Together with the conductor, Leopold Stokowski, they selected a number of classical music pieces. Roy said, can't we do something simpler, something that I and people like me would like? And Walt said to him, go get the money and we will, well, we will engage in high art. They selected works by Bach, Tchaikovsky, Mussorgsky, Beethoven. And each of these works was, well, it's hard to say, illustrated, animated. I don't know how to define what was done, especially considering how incredibly different they are. So it's kind of like a movie concert. It all starts with the sounds of a tuning orchestra. Then the host comes out and starts explaining what's going to happen. He explains before each subsequent act. That Beethoven wrote the pastoral symphony with shepherds and shepherdesses, and we transferred this to ancient Greece telling about the magical creatures that will be seen here. There Stravinsky wrote the Rite of Spring about pagan rituals, and we believe that it reflects the creation of the earth and up to the appearance, and then the extinction of dinosaurs. Stravinsky was horrified. He received a letter offering him $5,000 to use his music. And then they hinted that if you Refuse will still use it because the rights to your music, they were registered in pre-revolutionary Russia, they are now invalid in America. But he had to agree. And of course, they were cutting some parts, removing, changing. He was completely shocked in a bad sense of the word. And he said, and this film, this idiocy in general, I don't want to comment on, but it's not idiocy. There are incredibly beautiful places there. Well, in general, the whole film is very beautiful. But there, let's say Bach. These are absolutely abstract forms on the screen. Looks strangely beautiful, sounds strangely beautiful. Beethoven, for some reason, is illustrated with centaurs, cupids, and some kind of ancient Greek bacchanalia. The Sorcerer's Apprentice suite, for some reason, Mickey Mouse is playing the role of the Sorcerer's Apprentice which is completely inconsistent with everything else. And when this part ends, Mickey comes out to the director and says, thank you, Mr. Stokowski, he says, thank you, Mickey. You watch and don't understand what it is. Is it a Disney fairy tale or some abstract art? What is it at all? At some point, the host says, and now we will have a 15 minute intermission. Well, there can't be an intermission in a movie. But then the curtain closes, the musicians leave, and then they immediately return. Why all this? But at the premiere, there was crazy enthusiasm, and Disney and Stokowski had already discussed a sequel, and the sequel was supposed to be completely unexpected as well. Disney wanted them to make more short novelties and add them or maybe change them. And he said, and then people, in order to see this new novelty, would come and watch the whole movie again. So it would be like a, well, a refreshing concert on the screen. And this completely unexpected, especially for the year 1940 idea, it failed for many reasons. First of all, of course, financial. Disney, with his pursuit of technical innovations, he found some completely new sound equipment called Fanta Sound. And they installed it for a whole week in this theater in New York, where the premiere was. It cost a lot of money, but it produced an incredible sound. And he wanted to gradually equip theaters across the country with this new equipment so that everyone could hear this sound. It was insanely expensive. Moreover, it was 1940. The Second World War was already going on. America had not yet entered the war, but in general, it was still strange. In this way, both children and adults watched The Three Little Pigs and Snow White, Pinocchio adults, didn't really want to watch anymore. Something changed, 
War in Europe, life was hard. They didn't want to watch about a wooden boy. Fantasia. On the contrary, was mostly watched by adults. Two hours of classical music with a very strange audience, with some strange ideas. Suddenly he says, now I will show you what a soundtrack is. And the soundtrack like a living creature appears. He asks, show. Us a trombone. The sound of a trombone is heard and some abstract paintings. Of course, it was very difficult to imagine that as many people would watch it as watch Snow White. The military demanded that they stopped producing this Fanta sound, this equipment, because there were some details needed for the war industry. Disney said that it was due to the stupidity of the audience and that they couldn't install the equipment and the war and the bad weather. Although Fantasia was watched and continues to be watched, it certainly didn't bring in any money. It brought complete ruin. And these were two such strong blows for him and for Pinocchio and Fantasia. Meanwhile, another story is developing that will undermine Disney, not to death, but very strongly. The studio is running out of money. In 1940, Disney had to, gritting his teeth, agree to openly sell shares. Naturally, the brothers keep a controlling stake for themselves but still the very thought that other shareholders would somehow interfere in the affairs of his beloved studio is absolutely terrible for him. But in this way, they attract more capital. But then it turns out that not only shareholders want to interfere throughout the 1930s. There was a constant, persistent struggle in Hollywood between the studio management and the employees for the right to create unions. Well, in Hollywood, I also said that one of the reasons why many cinematographers went from the East Coast to the West was that in Los Angeles, there were practically no unions. It was completely unacceptable there. Accordingly, the studio owners did whatever they wanted, paid whatever they wanted, fired whoever they wanted. But there in the early 1920s, of course, there was a crisis. Here too, everyone is sitting quietly. But gradually dissatisfaction grows and unions begin to emerge, both in Hollywood and on the East Coast in the studios. And people try to achieve some rights for themselves. This causes the utmost rage, but there were several reactions. First, at different stages, attempts were made by the owners to create their own in-house unions. Well, this was also done at Disney. They just handed out membership cards to everyone and now we have our own union, which will take care of us under the control of the owners. But not everyone was willing to accept this. There were studios, for example, there was a New York studio where they obtained through the court, through arbitration, the right to an independent union. And the owner had to give in, after which he said that he was moving all production to Florida because it was more convenient for him and everyone moved there. Accordingly, not all employees went there and the union fell apart. For Disney, the idea of an independent union at his studio is something impossible. He is like a father to them. He takes such good care of them. He immediately assumes that it's the communists stirring up trouble. And indeed, there were members of the Communist Party. Some conflicts arose, but it seemed that they could be ignored. But this is a process that concerns not only the Disney studio, but in principle. A guild of animators is formed, an independent union led by very left-wing, very charismatic, very firm, self-confident people. Here two forces collided, so equal in energy and determination. Disney is informed that several hundred of its employees also want to join this guild. Well, he quickly reminds them that they have their own federation. Negotiations begin. At first, they simply created an independent union at the studio, which wanted to join this guild. But since Disney does not allow this, there were long agonizing negotiations, intrigues, and for some reason, very quickly. Gangsters got involved, whom, of course, Disney uses. Although it seems, of course, that they are not gangsters, they are just negotiators, but everyone knows who these people are. And finally, in 1941, a strike begins. 
it is not entirely clear how many people were on strike. Naturally, Disney and his supporters said a very small number, the strikers said a large number, but there were quite a few of them in general. In addition, it was an animator strike, so there were painted posters. It was written that Mickey Mouse or Goofy was on strike and someone else. Famous actors came to support them. It was such a bright event, covered in the press. Moreover, the main lawyer, whom Disney relied on, told him that they would all disperse tomorrow. And they drank champagne to celebrate this. And they did not disperse the next day or the day after. And all this lasted quite a long time and drove Disney into incredible rage. He was on the verge of a nervous breakdown and negotiations were starting there. Everything came down to one question. Disney said, okay, we will hold elections in an independent union, but it will be a secret ballot. Well, the idea is, of course, that you, citizens, leftists, are intimidating my employees. So they side with you and they say there will be no secret ballot. So you most likely will be. Here we already have cards filled out by people and there is no need to vote. And here comes the collision. At some point he tried to use the police, but the police didn't want to get involved. Finally, Roosevelt sent negotiators from Washington and both sides agreed that they accept the authority of these negotiators. And something began. Disney was in such a rage and in such a state that his brother convinced him to go on a long trip to South America. He was sent as a kind of goodwill ambassador to the South American countries. And while he was there, naturally he was greeted by cheering crowds and his health improved. They agreed, they agreed. To a salary increase that now only union members would be accepted. Well, and in general, many other things. For Disney, this was an incredible blow. It was a humiliation for him because he was, of course, a authoritarian person and did not like it when he was not obeyed. If he could fire someone for asks for a lunch break to be announced, and then this. Moreover, among the strikers, well, of course, mostly low-paid employees were on strike. But there were also very well-known animators, and he saw it as a betrayal. As a betrayal of his dream of a close-knit family. On the first day of the strike, when he arrived, he waved to them all, smiled and went to the studio. And Art Babbitt, the famous animator, who had worked for Disney but now led the strike, grabbed a megaphone and shouted, How shameful, Mr. Disney. Well, he goes on. And he says, Here comes Walt Disney, a man who believes in brotherhood for all except himself. Well, in other words, you all might be brothers, but I'm above you. And Disney was so furious that he almost lunged at him with his fists. They stopped him. And when he returns and finds out that in his absence, his brother made an agreement and they hired. Those who were on strike and their demands were met, he releases a statement, Disney. For me, he writes, the whole situation with the strike is a catastrophe. The spirit that played such an important role in creating cartoons has been destroyed. I am convinced that all these problems were created and organized by the communists. I am disgusted by what is happening. I would gladly quit my job and do something completely different if I didn't have to think about those who have remained loyal to me and believe in me. That's why I have to stay. I'm Sick, continuing in English, DD, disillusionment and discouragement. The strikers as if won and were reinstated. But for example, the same Art Babbitt was fired five times, but he always was reinstated through the court. And eventually the USA entered the war. He joined the army and then was reinstated through the court again. It's clear that when he was reinstated, he wasn't given any work at all. None of the loyal Disney people talked to him. He was still a big man and so he couldn't just be thrown away like that. But Disney, of course, remembered everyone who went on strike. And first of all, 
he quietly started firing different people. But the main thing is not even that. When during the war in Hollywood, the Commission on Young American Activities begins to work, which will then unfold. In the post-war years, Disney will be constantly cooperating with it. He will name specific people who led the strike and will assert that they are members of the Communist Party. For that time, it was a serious accusation. Quite a few people who went on strike against him in 1941, he will be able to remove from the profession. He will ensure that some of them cannot work for many years, that they will have very big problems. In general, he will settle scores with them. And here another question arises, to which there is also no single answer, because for quite a long time in various sources, in different books, in different publications, in journals, in newspapers, there have been claims that Disney for many years cooperated with the FBI, that he was an FBI agent, that he provided information on people working in Hollywood, reported on their leftist views, on their statements, on their performances. This is also a very big question. There are those who completely disagree with this. There is an interesting thing that at the end of Disney's life, he was appointed as a special agent of the FBI. And there are historians who believe that this was the result of his 25 years of productive activity, cooperation and informing on various people. And in the end, he was promoted from a simple agent. He was made special. At some point, the FBI said, yes, we just rewarded him like that. Well, we made him an honorary FBI employee. Well, how can this be verified? Some documents have been published, apparently reports on working with Disney. But how much does this indicate that he really cooperated? A very difficult question. But this is also such a big stain on his reputation. Even if he cooperated, it is clear that he did it based on his, well, right wing, fairly conservative beliefs and his ideas of patriotism. But at the same time, he informed on people and people lost their jobs at best. This question certainly also requires further clarification, investigation and evidence. But this accusation against him also hangs over him. 1941, America enters the Second World War, and now there's really no time for cartoons. Just before the war begins, the movie Dumbo comes out about a little elephant with big ears that everyone laughed at, but then it turns out he can fly. It does pretty well, although it doesn't bring in much revenue. Bambi is in the works for a very long time, and by now, everyone's tired of it when it's released in 1942, despite all these charming little animals, the wonderful depictions of nature, the touching story is just not what anyone wants. 1942, war, people are dying. Of course, there's light, love, everything's fine, but there's something missing. Today, it's considered a classic like, say, Snow White. In 1942, people didn't want to watch it. It was also a blow. Another blow was that, firstly, the military temporarily shut down the studio, saying they needed it to protect the dam, which could potentially be attacked and bombed by the Japanese. They needed to place artillery there. He says, why my studio specifically? But this short time lasted. But they still found it very unpleasant. And then on the one hand, they have big financial problems. On the other hand, it is completely unclear how to combine cartoons with war. It turns out that the government needs propagandistic cartoons and a large part of time and effort during the war years will be spent on what he will be filming. Movies, how to handle weapons, how to behave during bombings or just such. Propagandistic related to hygiene health. This brought in certain money, although not very large. But of course, it was all terribly boring. They made some films where Donald Duck mocks Hitler, something else. It's clear that these were just one day projects. At some point, Disney thought that he would influence everything that was happening. 
when he started making a big film about how aviation can ensure victory in war. And they all watched it, and the aviation specialist, whose ideas he was inspired by, was featured in this film. And they say it made a strong impression on Churchill, but, in general, the public as a whole, well, nothing special. I watched it, but nothing special. And by the end of the war, Disney was in such a sad state. He was still, of course, traumatized by the strike, because from his point of view, it was the strikers who destroyed that ideal climate of the 1930s that he had at his studio. Naturally, he now greatly idealizes what was happening at the studio, but he likes to think that everything was good before. Now it's not the same. There was a war. They were making unclear things. There was no money because all these big projects were losing money. In general, it's unclear what to do next. He had periods of depression when he completely left the studio, stayed at home, played with his daughters. He built a toy railroad around his house and rode the train around the house, road and road. At some point, the train derailed. He crashed into his living room to the horror of his wife. Then it seems he came to his senses, returned to the studio. He drank a lot. He couldn't figure out what to do. But at the same time, it's interesting how he's always looking for new ways. Here he, even during the war, began negotiations on a project that could lead to very unexpected results. And it's a great pity that it didn't materialize. He began negotiations with Salvador Dali about a joint animated film. And if you think about it, this combination may be much more logical than, say, classical music and animation. Dali, in general, is a completely pop artist. And at the same time, he is an artist whose objects change shapes, transition into one another. And they met, they discussed. They really wanted to do something together. But as always, there was not enough money. And in the post-war years, the studio begins to change very significantly. Of course, animation is still being produced, but now more attention is being paid to feature films. And Disney is taking part in this, developing and discussing, but the feeling that his heart is not really in it. He is not disappointed in animation, but somehow he can't make what he wants. Here there is not that complete control to which he is accustomed. Here it is impossible, as he imagines, to create some absolute fantasy world. Yes, they start shooting their treasure island, then something else. It all seems to him not quite. He remembers his love for nature, which never faded. He goes on various journeys and starts shooting what we would call today popular science animal films. He has a conflict with his brother who says, you don't understand what you're doing. These films won't bring us anything. Well, some of these films also received an Oscar, but in general, they didn't really become a super success. And they had a very strained relationship with their brother. By the end, they hardly spoke to each other, didn't pick up the phone if one called the other. But in general, they didn't call each other. But the studio somehow continues to exist. Disney is a great classic, and it's quite easy for him to get credits. The gaming movies still bring in money, of course. For Mickey Mouse, many... Studios tried to get the rights from him when he was in a difficult situation in the 1930s, but he didn't give those rights to anyone. And of course, Mickey Mouse continues to bring in money. Naturally, there is a lot of merchandise continues, but he still wants something new. At first, when television starts to spread, he takes it with a grain of salt and some. TV companies make him various offers to show his films. But he refuses because television is mostly black and white, and he doesn't want color films to be shown in black and white. Then he realizes that this is a completely new way of communicating with the audience. And he hosts a television show for which he shoots his programs. That is, he starts using this option. And then an idea matures in his mind. It's not for nothing that he rode a little train around his house. An idea matures in his mind that what was initially called Disneyland and then will become Disneyland. On one of the trips with his wife around Europe, again, 
as if to rest and improve health. But of course he is thinking about work all the time and they visit many amusement parks. But he sees that most of the parks, well, that's probably what we would call today an amusement park. That is here are roller coasters and here is a carousel and here are, well, some such things. And Disney is planning what will later be called a theme park. That is, he doesn't just want to put up attractions, he wants to create a park connected to his movies and some entertainment themes. Starting in 1952, he developed all these options. At first, he wanted to buy a plot near his studio, but firstly, there was a small plot the residents of the city of Burbank were upset next to which it was supposed to be. They said, we don't want it to be here. I don't know what they think now when Disneyland ended up in another place. Maybe they regret it or maybe not. Then very large financial efforts were required because he created a separate company from the studio, which was supposed to be responsible for this park. He raised money. This is again his, as if his activity revived, but already in a completely different field. He thought out the concept that it would be like a big city or country where there will be a main street along which visitors will go. And from there, they can go to different countries. It could be frontier land, the land of the frontier. That is what is related to the Wild West with cowboys. This is the place. It could be adventure land, the land of adventure, fantasy land the fairy tale, and Tomorrowland. That's what we call science fiction today. You can go everywhere. The train should connect them. So it all makes sense, but it requires incredible efforts. Here the plumbers start to strike again, pavers start to strike. And he already has the opening scheduled for the summer of 1955. And that's why Disney, who hates strikers, negotiates with them, he makes concessions because to him, it's more important to open on time and he puts all his efforts into it. At that moment, they are filming at the studio, the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And there was a model of the submarine Nautilus, which he also moved there quietly. Incredible things are being built there. And on July the 17th, 1955, the grand opening should take place. Instead, of course, a complete disaster happens because firstly, a lot of things were not ready. It was very hot. The asphalt had just been laid due to the strike. Women's heels were getting stuck in the asphalt. Drinking fountains were not working. Drinks were not being sold. The main thing, of course, is that it was the day when the invitations were supposed to be sent out. Employees of the studio, some cultural figures, journalists came. 15,000 invitations were distributed, but more than 30,000 people showed up. That is, a bunch of people about the same number as were invited, squeezed in without a ticket, and it was completely chaotic and terrible. Then they called it Black Sunday, and to top it all off, he had a microphone, which some journalists were recording with, and he was yelling terribly at the employees, using the same unpleasant words for which he was fired from the studio in the 1930s. And the microphone turned out to be on, and everyone heard it, which was also not very pleasant. Well, then his Disneyland was quickly closed and they started to improve it. That's Disney for you. He always knew how to recover after a failure and achieve something. Everything is getting better. Normal asphalt is being laid. Drink kiosks are selling. Drinking fountains are working. All the attractions are working. And so the story of Disneyland begins, which becomes Disneyland. At the same time, Disney moved to Disneyland for a while. He was, of course, not a young man, but not too old either. He was often seen in the little house where he lived. He stood at the window, watching the visitors and crying. Why? Because life is passing by? Or because he's no longer in his studio, where, well, there were rumors that, in fact, he moved because he was meeting women there. But maybe it's true, or maybe it really was his new baby. He couldn't tear himself away from it. He still has a lot of different plans. He plans to continue building parks. He wants to build a park in Florida and in it, 
create some kind of ideal community of the future. This idea of such a wonderful life in a semi-fantastic, semi-real world, like in the studio, it didn't leave him. In general, he could have found common ground with the communists if he hadn't been so stubborn because they also have these thoughts about some kind of heavenly human unions. For the last 10 years of his life, he has been involved in Disneyland. He's been involved in television. And for example, these Mickey Mouse clubs, which still existed in the 1930s, he now transfers the program to television. He communicates with children here. This is also popular. He dreams of creating some wonderful settlements within these amusement parks. Of course, he's much less involved in movies now, although he certainly keeps an eye on them and also keeps his hand on the pulse. But this, of course, is not the same. But his health is very much deteriorating, especially since he smokes a lot. He is still surrounded by adoration. At some point, a famous actor, Kirk Douglas, came to visit him with his sons and Disney filmed them riding on this train around his house and then showed it in one of his television shows. Douglas was terribly upset that without his permission, they showed even in a small shot, his sons, and he sued Disney. And then withdrew his complaint and made a statement that yes, it's outrageous. He filmed my children without my permission and so on. And then I thought, that Walt Disney, he's like, God, you can't sue God. That's the attitude at the end of his life. In 1966, Disney dies not very old, but of course with health completely undermined by his endless work, smoking, nervous attacks. It's very interesting that he Bequeathed his estate, of course, to his wife, of course, to his daughters, sister, and nieces. But to his brother, his nephew. That is male relatives, he left nothing. Well, they were all certainly not poor. But the obvious idea was that they should make their own way. After that, there is a struggle in the Disney family for control of the studio of Disneyland. And his brother is also aging, stepping back from business, then dies. And the main struggle will be quite long between Disney's son-in-law and his nephew, the son of his brother, each of whom had their own supporters, their own factions. And it seems that the son-in-law couldn't do anything at all. And in the end, the nephew won. Who then went on to lead the Disney company to the incredible heights it reaches today and to the millions they earn. But that will be, of course, a completely different story. Thanks to everyone who contributed to this lecture. Thanks to our sponsors on YouTube and our patrons on Patreon. Thanks to those who support us on the Boosty platform. Please don't forget to like, share, especially since today. The holidays are still ongoing. Some we have already celebrated, some are ahead. It's very good to do a good deed. And of course, as always, with all the holidays, both past and upcoming, I congratulate everyone and wish you all the very best. Well, and of course, it's interesting to know what you think about Disney's works, both old and new, what you like, what you don't like. I look forward to your comments. Best wishes.